Welcome back everyone to another video and today we're going to be reacting to What Culture Star Wars 20 Things You Somehow Missed in Star Wars Episode 5 The Empire Strikes Back. Continuing the series, we actually only have one episode left after this until he releases his sequel ones and his Rogue One one. So yeah, I'll cover those when they come out, but today and tomorrow are the last two days of the series until he releases more of them. So yeah, just like last one's, I'm going to be going through all of these, telling you guys which ones I knew, which ones I didn't. I'll leave this channel and the video in the description, along with all the other video reactions I've done to him, uh, relating to the things you saw my missing Star Wars episode 5 of The Empire Strikes Back. So without further ado, guys, let's jump into it. The legendary Empire Strikes Back almost instantly became the blueprint for how to successfully build on the magic of a prior cinematic smash hit 43 years ago. Taking things into far darker and often uncomfortable territory, as our plucky rebel heroes continue to push back against an increasingly powerful Empire. And while Episode 5 has since gone on to become possibly the most beloved Star Wars entry of all time, that still doesn't necessarily mean that each and every secret Easter egg and a glorious movie-making trick present in the 1980 masterpiece has been successfully frozen in carbonite for all to see. Gareth here from What Culture Star Wars and here are 20 things you somehow missed in Star Wars Episode 5 The Empire Strikes Back. Number 20, Luke never fires his blaster. When you can rely on something as unquestionably cool and effective as a damn laser sword, opting for a generic blaster can best be described as a somewhat uncivilized alternative. And that's an opinion Luke Skywalker seemingly shared with his one-time master Obi-Wan Kenobi, with the son of Anakin never actually firing off a blaster shot at any stage in The Empire Strikes Back. That's right, despite wandering the halls of Cloud City with his weapon ready to fire, and regularly being spotted with it on his person, not once does the Jedi in training choose to pull the trigger in the sequel. Um, I did not know that, but... Mm, um, I, yeah, I didn't know that, but I did always find it confusing why he didn't fire that blaster in the scene, and I also found it confusing why he was even holding his blaster. He should have just had his lightsaber out. But yeah, I never realized he never fired it. I didn't know he didn't fire it in like this that, that, that one scene that they just showed. Number 19, an elephant and seal were used for those Wampa whales. Throwing poor old Luke into a pretty rough spot out of the gates, Episode 5 sees the rebel hero being imprisoned by a fierce, abominable snowman-like being known as a Wampa. Viciously taking down Skywalker's Tauntaun before dragging his knocked-out figure back to his icy lair, the unsettling shrieks this mountain of white terror unleashed weren't actually as alien as the monster itself. According to masterful sound designer Ben Burt, a combination of a lion eating a cow's head, elephants erupting and a squawking sea lion all help bring to life the startling wails of the fearsome beast at various points in its showing. Number 18, a lightsaber reversal. Staying within the Wampa's freezing home, one of Luke's first real examples of him successfully using the Force comes during the moment the unlucky Jedi finds himself hanging upside down in the cave. And more on that later. Skywalker is able to successfully force pull his lightsaber and slash his way out of the ice before chopping down his captor and making a break for it. And while you would have been forgiven for just assuming this brilliant practical effect was achieved via some expert wire work, you'd actually only be half right. Because while wires were very much used to assist Mark Hamill's epic force yanking out of the snow, they were actually used to pull the lightsaber from his hand rather than to it. This moment was then reversed later on, meaning that you're really watching a backwards version of a lightsaber falling to the ground here. Mind blown. Um, I did not know that, but... I mean, that doesn't surprise me at all. Number 17, the Force is strong with Upside Down Skywalker. And while on the topic of an Upside Down Luke, the galaxy's most reliable hero doesn't half have a habit of ending up in that rather specific position over the course of The Empire Strikes Back. Far from being a bizarre coincidence though, the Force-sensitive protagonist's regular hanging and standing upside down can actually be linked to the way his world is somewhat flipped on its head during these particular moments. The aforementioned Hoth suspending comes during a moment when Luke is likely realizing he's not as bold bulletproof as he felt he was post Death Star destruction. His Dagobah headstand comes in the thick of discovering the true ways of the Force, and his Cloud City dangling swiftly follows Vader's iconic father revelation. How's that for some Force-sensitive symbolism, eh? Number 16. Uh, I did not know that. A burning Imperial pilot in space. 
In a far more brutal instance of a Star Wars character having their world turned upside down, the 1980 classic's epic asteroid field chase comes equipped with a blink and you'll miss it reminder of just how deadly and morbidly hilarious space can actually be. With the Millennium Falcon being hunted down by a set of Imperial TIE fighters during the sequence, one of the Empire's pilots suddenly gets a little too close to an asteroid. As the ship is well and truly destroyed, however, slowing down the footage reveals a tiny little pilot being fired from the wreckage whilst being very much on fire himself. Talk about going out in a blaze of shockingly comical glory. Number 15. I did not know that. Being a matte painting Bespin background. Long before George Lucas got his hands on a green screen, the go-to solution for creating a larger-than-life or out-of-this-world background involves some incredibly gifted artists producing frequently outstanding matte paintings. And that could be some of the most impressive pop-up during the Empire Strikes Back spell on Cloud City. Along with the unquestionably gorgeous Bespin metropolis seen behind the Millennium Falcon as it lands in the unmistakable locale, the eerie chasm within the city which plays host to Vader and Skywalker's game-changing duel was also largely brought to life through astounding paintings. Even with that knowledge in mind though, it's still fairly hard not to get lost in a beautifully realized setting that feels about as real as the world outside your window. Number four. Um, yeah, I didn't know that. Seen a Doctor Who bounty hunter cameo. You'd be surprised just how many props and costumes have found themselves being recycled on the big and small screen over the years. And likely even more shocked to discover that a piece of Doctor Who history actually managed to wiggle its way into the galaxy far, far away all those years ago. Those loyal Whovians all over the galaxy probably found themselves suffering from a bit of deja vu when slimy bounty hunter Bosk first wandered onto the episode 5 scene. That's because the eye catching spacesuit the Ocean is seen sporting actually first popped up in 1966's The Tenth Planet episode from the Doctor Who series. In that episode, a similar looking Windak flight suit is worn by a human figure, though it isn't 100% known whether this was the exact same costume that would be later used 14 years on in The Empire Strikes Back. But at the very least, both Bosk and this Who figure shared a fondness for this type of distinct yellow jumpsuit. Number th I did not know that, and we're doing terrible so far, so hopefully there's some I actually know. 13, it's the only time Tatooine doesn't show up in the first six Skywalker Saga films. Easily ranking as the most well-known and important planet taking up a spot in the galaxy far, far away. The home of Luke and Anakin Skywalker regularly acts as the backdrop to some of the series' most iconic moments. But what tends to be lost in all of the frosty hoth skirmishes and hand-chopping that goes down in episode 5 is the fact that this movie actually sits as the only one within the prequel and original trilogies not to showcase a scene happening on Tatooine. And as another interesting piece of often overlooked trivia, Tatooine's appearances in episodes 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, and 9 mean that it ranks as the planet with the most appearances in the Skywalker Saga 2. Number um, no. I did not know that, but it doesn't surprise me. Let's see. Tatooine wasn't in Solo or Rogue One, obviously. It wasn't in 7, even though it should have just been Jakku. And it was not an eight. So yeah. <laughs> Number 12, Vader and C-3PO's only original trilogy scene together happens here. Speaking of Tatooine's importance within the Star Wars franchise, this was also the planet that Anakin Skywalker was ultimately revealed to have built everyone's favorite neurotic droid C-3PO on. Throughout much of the original trilogy, however, Darth Vader and his creation don't actually share all that many scenes together. With the one and only instance of the pair reuniting actually coming as Han Solo is about to be frozen in carbonite. And in the case of some fans perhaps adding their own little pieces of cannon into the mix for some additional fun. The sight of Vader keeping Boba Fett from firing on a frustrated Chewbacca with 3PO on his back has been interpreted as the Dark Lord not wanting to harm his one-time robotic pal all these years later. No. Vader didn't even know 3PO was there. I doubt it. I mean, 3PO was being super loud. Maybe, he knew, I don't know. But no, it was just because he didn't want to kill him at any of them. He wanted his plan. Because Lucas definitely had this all mapped out from the beginning, right? Number 11, Carrie Fisher and Harrison Ford were drunk on Cloud City. As the late, great Carrie Fisher would eventually reveal many years down the road, both herself and Harrison Ford don't do an awful lot of smiling as their Leia Organa and Han Solo respectively struggle to evade the Empire in Episode 5. But on one specific occasion, the two could very much be spotted smirking like naughty school kids when walking around on Cloud City. And this was mostly down to the fact the pair of party animals were still 
a bit drunk from the wild evening before. Said night of partying involved everything from the Rolling Stones to Monty Python's Eric Idol to what was described as a Tunisian death drink, with the end results forcing the leading stars who hadn't slept a wink to crack a set of still somewhat intoxicated grins when encountering Lando Calrissian for the first time in the series. I did not realize that. Number 10, Boba Fett's face is briefly glimpsed. While he may have grown into one of the most adored figures in the galaxy on the back of his rather mysterious live-action debut in The Empire Strikes Back, in reality, the reveal of precisely who was hiding underneath that iconic Mandalorian helmet actually went down under fans' very noses in Episode 5. Brought to life by Jeremy what? Bullock during his original trilogy days, the actor behind Boba Fett actually rocked up without a mask on Cloud City, playing Galactic Empire Lieutenant Shekel as Leia tries to warn Luke that he'd wandered into a trap. This wasn't always the plan, though. Bullock simply stepped in late on in the wake of the original Shekel actor suddenly not being available to shoot on the day. Oh, so it wasn't that wasn't Boba Fett. That was just another character who was played by the same actor. Okay. Thought, like, actually, Boba Fett was a mess. I did not know that. For nine, no special effects were needed for Hoth's Blizzard. Episode 5 may not boast the sort of relentless CGI and special effects pumped into the galaxy throughout the prequel trilogy, thank heavens, but the brilliant minds behind the various alien planets, technology, and characters found in The Empire Strikes Back still threw their fair share of mind-blowing technical feats into the sequel. However, when it came time to shoot the relentlessly snowy sequences on Hoth involving the Rebels trying to fight off both the incoming Empire and some seriously treacherous weather, that latter element didn't really require any digital or practical wizardry at all. So the next time you take in the moment involving Luke Skywalker trying his best to keep from freezing to death post Wampa escape, do so with the knowledge of Mark Hamill being genuinely and rather cruelly dumped in the middle of a legit snowstorm, while the rest of the cast and crew watched on from the comfort of a nice warm hotel close by with a cup of joe. God, that's awful. I did not know that. I just assumed they did CGI on it. Number 8, Alcatraz helped bring a Vader moment to life. It turns out that none other than the most famous prison facility on the planet helped create one of the most intimidating big bads in the galaxy's many unsettling moments. When listening to the sound of the doors on Vader's Star Cruiser slam shut during Episode 5, what you're actually hearing is the noise of an entire block of Alcatraz cell doors slamming with the flicking of one big ol' switch. This was reportedly captured by Lucas himself during a visit to the notorious prison, and it definitely helped add some extra real-world terror to the already formidable spacecraft. Number seven, Ralph. Didn't I didn't know that? Macquarie's Hoth Walk On. Concept designer and all-round legendary illustrator Ralph Macquarie's fingerprints are all over the Star Wars universe. And not just that, but Macquarie himself also managed to land a cheeky cameo showing during Episode 5 too. Walking in front of one of the matte painting backgrounds that he helped bring into being, the brilliant artist takes on the small cameo role of General Fal Macquarie on Hoth. See what they did there? Also, this brief rebel-based shot came equipped with sneaky appearances from fellow concept artists Joe Johnston, Harrison Ellenshaw, and Michael Pan. Grazio. No. I did not know that. Number six, a potato asteroid field. Jumping back into the perilous moment involving Han Solo and the gang trying to keep from getting blown to pieces by some incoming TIE fighters amidst a field of asteroids, said floating rocks in space actually weren't all that they initially seemed in some cases. As noted by some of the brilliant minds behind everything from the Millennium Falcon to the humongous space rocks in question, when trying to land on a design for these asteroids, the team finally decided on a look that someone quickly pointed out looked similar to a potato. Without missing a beat, it was soon decided that throwing a bunch of actual spuds into the distant background of the asteroid belt wouldn't be the worst idea in the world. So if you look closely enough, you'll definitely catch a few floating taters threatening to collide with the Falcon. I did not know that. I can't I can't believe how bad we're doing here. I just said I just said what yesterday that episode two is my worst one, and then right after that, episode four became my worst one. Now episode three. Number five Can it even I mean Okay, that's we've been through fourteen so far, so I could tie with episode three and solo if I know the rest. We'll have to see though. Boba Fett is never mentioned by name. From the very second he showed up in the middle of a collection of unsettling bounty hunters on Darth Vader's Star Destroyer in The Empire Strikes Back, most instantly found themselves gripped by the best car sporting badass that is Boba Fett. That being said, those who hadn't sat through the debacle that was the Star Wars Holiday Special, gone mad over the newest must-have Star Wars action figure beforehand, or chosen to stick around for Episode 5's end credits, would have been forgiven for having next to no clue who this not-exactly-talkative masked figure actually was. Why? Well, because Fett 
Death's name isn't actually said at any point in The Empire Strikes Back. With his first big screen mention by name surprisingly coming in E.T. the Extraterrestrial two years later. Number f uh, I did no I I did know that, so thank god I finally knew one. Four, Captain Wedge Antilles tied Luke as the deadliest figure on show. Though it was admittedly nowhere near as deadly as the episode that came before it, you know, the one that saw a planet get destroyed, The Empire Strikes Back did still involve a grand total of 46,987 beings being taken out at various stages in the tale. What likely will come as a rather significant shock to those who have regularly consumed the grittier follow-up to A New Hope, however, is precisely which on-screen figure is responsible for the tied most kills in Episode 5. According to List of Death's wiki, alongside the supposed hero of the day, Luke Skywalker, none other than Captain Wedge Antilles can claim to being the deadliest presence in the 1980 hit. Both rebel men killed 43 individuals each, sitting a significant way above Chewbacca's third place total of seven. So much for being the good guys, eh? Number th I did not know that. Three kids actually played rebel extras. Potatoes weren't the only unexpected elements sneakily chucked into episode 5's action. During the moments that play out within the rebels' base on the snowy world of Hoth, many a child was actually dressed up as a rebel soldier and worker scurrying around in the background. This was done in order to help enhance the feeling of the hangar being far bigger than it actually was when shooting. And it worked a treat, to be honest, with it being rather difficult to spot that those troopers and freedom fighters in the distance were actually little more than kids playing dress up. And who wouldn't love the chance to run around on a Star Wars set all day, right? Number two, Rebel. I did not know that. Rebels use bubble wrap for reasons. That seen during the shots of Luke and Wedge trying to disable the formidable 8080s on Hoth, or at at if you're that kind of person, both rebel murderers can actually be found sporting random sheets of bubble wrap on their seatbelts. Was this actually some sort of alien material capable of ensuring the pilots would be safe from harm should they crash land into the tundra below? Yeah, possibly. But it's more likely this was little more than a cheap way to add some detail to an otherwise bland looking prop on the day. Bubble wrap was also found on the seatbelts of the Millennium Falcon too, with Star Wars lover and director Ryan Johnson opting to leave it there when guiding episode 8 onto the big screen. Number 1 I did not know that. On Yoda's hut was made from his escape pod. After first encountering the quirky alien life form on the swampy planet of Dagobah in episode 5, Luke is invited into Yoda's hut for a bite to eat, before finding out that he's actually conversing with the powerful Jedi Master he's been searching for. What many likely didn't realize during this and the numerous other moments spent inside of Yoda's home, though, is that said hut is actually partially made up of parts from the escape pod that brought him to the planet all those years ago. As revealed in a Revenge of the Sith deleted scene, Yoda landed on the planet strong with the Force in an E3 standard starship lifeboat. He would then go on to live in the ship for a time before it began to degrade and was ultimately consumed by the swamp a year into his exile. So Yoda decided to forge a new home, one that came equipped with some of the materials he could salvage from the broken down pod slash home. He even powered his new gaff using the lifeboat's backup power supply. But as impressive as the Jedi Master's ability to improvise and evolve to his surroundings may be, it's definitely difficult to look at his home the same way after realizing it likely serves as a painful constant reminder of the world he left behind post Order 66. Um, I did not know that, but... That's interesting, and that deleted scene is also interesting, and it always makes me want to, I really want to, I'm pretty sure the original cut for episode 3 before they deleted all the scenes was like 5, maybe even 6 hours long. I really want to see that version of the movie, because they cut out so much stuff, and I get it, like no one wants to watch a 6 hour movie, but like, I, re I really, like for people like me, and I'm sure a lot of you guys who are like diehard Star Wars fans, I would love to see an extended version of this movie because this is, um, or episode three because episode three is my favorite Star Wars movie and even all the, all the movies. Hey Disney, give us all the Star Wars movies, all the extended versions of them with all the deleted scenes. Just throw them in there. But yeah, I would love to see an extended version of episode three because I'm pretty sure that cut the most material of any movie cut. And that's our list. No any other things people somehow missed in Star Wars Episode 5, The Empire Strikes Back? Let us know all about them in the comments section right down below. And do not forget to like, share, and click on that subscribe button while you're at it. Also, if this kind of stuff strikes a chord with you, then please head on over to whatculture.com and find some more fantastic articles just like the one this video you're watching right this second is based on. I've been Gareth from What Culture Star Wars. May the force be with you as always. Thanks so much for watching this lovely video today. And hopefully I'll see your pretty, pretty faces very, very soon. Bye-bye. All right, guys. There you go. Um, 
Yep, that's my worst one yet. I knew one. One. Uno. I did not know 19 of them. Episode 1, I knew 9. Didn't know 11. I don't know how I knew that many. Episode 2, I knew 5. I didn't know 15. Episode 3 and Solo, I knew 6. Didn't know 14. Episode 4, I knew 3 and I didn't know 17. This one, I knew 1 and not 19. I didn't know. That is terrible. I cannot believe I knew that little.